Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kinda Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder, and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness, and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and moral corruption. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg, and we have a perilous journey ahead, so thank you for lending me your courage and good company. Today's episode is entitled, Real Life Lycanthropes, The Savage Werewolf Murder of Bradford Jackson. Now, I've always had a rule of my own, which goes something like this. When disparate cultures that did not encounter each other all seem to believe in the same mythical creature, and then when they go so far as to describe that creature in the same way, then it's a myth worth revisiting. Dragons immediately spring to mind. Medieval Britain has St. George and the Dragon, and of course dragons feature prominently in both ancient and modern Chinese and other Asian cultures. Western and Eastern dragons differ in that Western dragons tend to be imagined as evil or adversarial, while Eastern dragons are generally benevolent. However, while there is a key difference in the presumed nature of dragons, it should be noted that the appearance of dragons is described almost identically. They are large, winged reptiles, but it's virtually academically and historically impossible that ancient Britons encountered ancient Asian peoples. And yet, we have all this commonality in the existence and appearance of dragons. So, all of these people who never met each other must have all met the same sorts of dragons, right? So, what were they? Did a few pterodactyls survive the meteor? If these different and separate cultures all describe this supposedly imaginary beast in the same way, it must have real roots, right? There's another mythical creature that has more direct bearing on today's story, and also, like dragons, seems to have various characteristics in common across many different cultures and legends. And that is, of course, the werewolf. Now today I'm going to be telling you about a werewolf murder from 2018, specifically the murder of 65-year-old Bradford Jackson from Alexandria, Virginia, at the hands of 34-year-old New Jersey native Pankaj Basin. But before we get to the murder story, I'd like to pose you two sets of questions, which you can consider, one before the murder and one after. And those questions are, what is a werewolf really? What do the legends say and what do they have in common? And where among all the mythology does the actual non-magical truth reside? And question set number two, ponder this. What is the purpose of the justice system and incarceration in particular? Is it a deterrent? Is it a punishment? Is it protection? By which I mean public safety, the imperative or right of society to protect its citizens from real and present danger. Is it rehabilitation? Now, I'd imagine that most people believe that it's some combination of all four, and that each person likely puts a different weight or moral imperative to each of those four qualities, depending on their own beliefs and priorities. So, as you hear about the werewolf murder of Bradford Jackson, ask yourself, which of these four objectives, I'd even go so far as to call them obligations, do you find to be the most important? Deterrent, punishment, protection, or rehabilitation? And where do you think that the state of Virginia succeeded or failed in carrying out those objectives or obligations. Now, before we get to the actual murder, I'm going to spend a little time talking about werewolf legends, because there are elements of the 2018 werewolf murder that are consistent with werewolf legend. And werewolf legend is so ancient and pervasive that an absolutely massive chunk of human history, more than 4,000 years in fact, from before the Great Flood as described in the Bible, all the way up until today, most of us assume that werewolves are pure fantasy. But might it instead be true that werewolves really do walk among us? Some believe that the first mention of werewolves in human society dates back to the earliest surviving notable work of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, carved into a clay tablet and dating all the way back to pre-deluge, that's antediluvian, pre-biblical flood. And that is old, back to some time around 2100 BC in Mesopotamia, known today as Iraq. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the god-king Gilgamesh, who is believed to have ruled around 2600 BC, spurns a potential lover, the fertility goddess Ishtar, because 
When she grew bored of her previous paramour, Ishtar turned the poor boy into a wolf and he was immediately ripped to shreds by his own hounds. So yeah, if you thought getting broken up with by text was bad, hey, at least you weren't turned into a wolf and then ripped to shreds by your own dogs. So this horrible death may be the first mention of a man turning into a wolf in recorded history. Next up, we have the legend of King Lycoan. This is the man from whom the word lycanthropy is derived. A werewolf, or really any human who transforms into another animal, not necessarily a wolf, is called a lycanthrope. Now, King Lycoan, the ancient Greek ruler of the city of Arcadia, is said to have ruled sometime around 2300 BC, in the literal months and days before the Great Flood. And in fact, some myths say that Zeus flooded the world as punishment for Lycoan's evil. When Zeus visited Lycoan, Lycoan didn't believe Zeus was an omniscient god. He thought he was essentially a flimflam man, a faker. So, Lycoan resolved to serve Zeus the flesh of a murdered Malosian male child for dinner. Lycoan reasoned that if Zeus were indeed omniscient and not just a charlatan, then he would know that the meat was human and not eat it. Zeus did know it was human meat, and he punished Lycoan by turning him into a wolf. And here we have another very early appearance of lycanthropy, or werewolfism, this time as a divine punishment for child murder and cannibalism. But hang on to that thought. For while the first mentions of werewolves may go all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and Greece, if you're like me, you probably associate werewolves first and foremost with Europe. And of course today, I'm telling you a werewolf murder story from very recent, 2018, in the United States. But before I do that, I've got to give you a quick greatest hits of some of the more famous historical werewolves in European history. In 1589, in the town of Bedburg in Germany, there lived a man named Peter Stubb, known as the Werewolf Farmer of Bedburg. The region had been laid waste during the Cologne War between Catholics and Protestants, and now citizens of the town of Bedburg were being killed, and rumors began to circulate about a wolf-like creature roaming around killing both people and livestock. Attempts were made for several years to capture and kill the monster with no success until a group of men managed to track it and encircle it with their dogs. When the hunters closed in, they found not a wolf, but Peter Stubb. He was tortured and confessed to killing one man, two pregnant women, and 13 children. According to a pamphlet circulated in London the next year, he further told his captors that he had made a pact with the devil when he was 12 years old, exchanging his soul for various worldly pleasures. And when Stubb didn't feel this was enough incentive on his own, Satan gave him a belt that allowed him to turn into a wolf, and he used his wolf form to commit any number of atrocities, including incest, murder, and cannibalism. He was executed on October 31st, 1589, horribly and gruesomely, accused of incest and were burned alive. Stubb's head was mounted on the body of a wolf and set in public as a warning to others who might be considering lycanthropy. Next up would be Jean Garnier, 1573, the werewolf of Dole. There's also Jacques Rollet, 1598, the werewolf of Angiers. Then there were the werewolves of Geneva, the werewolves of Poligny. There was Michael Verdun and Pierre Bourget and Philibert Montat. And rather than go through each of these stories, just know that this all happened in between the 1500s and the 1600s, and the common features in virtually every case were the murder of children, cannibalism, and some kind of substance or clothing that helped the offender turn into a werewolf. Often there was a magical salve acquired from Satan because, of course, deals with Satan were common to all these stories. As we had just heard, in the case of Peter Stubb, he had a magical belt, but generally it was either a magical ointment or magical ritualistic clothing, and sometimes the lack thereof, that was used to aid the transformation. So that's the European werewolf for you. Now let's move to North America. Now medieval and Renaissance European werewolves were also sometimes referred to as skin changers, which made me immediately think of Native Americans, specifically Navajo, skinwalkers. Now in Navajo culture, a skinwalker is a type of harmful witch who has the ability to turn into, possess, or disguise themselves as an animal, and in some cases, to kill and steal the skin of a human, and then perfectly mimic that human. Now, this type of witch is called Yi Narulushi by the Navajo. This is just one of several types of Navajo witches, 
but it's considered the most volatile and dangerous. Interestingly, Yi Nadalushi are often depicted wearing a wolf or coyote head, or even fully transformed into a wolf. And after all, Yi Nadalushi translates to it goes on all fours. Sounds quite a bit like a werewolf, doesn't it? And just as werewolves in Europe were described as practicing cannibalism and selling their souls to the devil, Native American skinwalkers are evil witches. And this type of Navajo witchcraft is known as witchery way, which uses human corpses in various ways, such as tools from the bones and concoctions that are used to curse, harm, or kill intended victims. Interestingly, for the Navajo people, witchcraft is just another part of their spirituality and one of their ways of life. And by ways, I mean a path that can be chosen. And as such, witchcraft has long been part of their culture, history, and traditions. And witches exist alongside humans and are not considered supernatural. There is also the Native American legend of the Wendigo, a creature of ravenous and insatiable hunger. And any person will be transformed into a Wendigo after eating human flesh. And once you become a Wendigo... You will always be hungry, no, starving, in fact, for human flesh, and that it is a hunger that can never be sated. In all of these cases, we talk about humans who engage in cannibalism and then transform into a sort of inexorable, slavering, monstrous, hungry, animalistic beast. So we've talked about some similarities that Navajo skinwalkers may have with werewolf legend. What about European or non-indigenous culture in the United States? Well... When I dove into the newspaper archives, the first mention I found of werewolves was in the Coshocton Democrat out of Ohio on August 15, 1871. And it was not a werewolf sighting, but rather a recounting of a scholarly paper written by Professor John Fisk of Harvard University, in which he attempts to disambiguate werewolf legends. The common elements he arrives at are homicidal insanity and cannibalism, and often the murder of children. Examples given are some you've already heard, the Epic of Gilgamesh, King like Cohen of Arcadia, Jean Grenier, and Fisk adds to these the Hungarian Countess Elizabeth, famous for murdering supposedly 650 female children and bathing in their blood and drinking it. Then there was the French nobleman Marshal de Retz, who similarly was famous for eating scores and scores of children and drinking their blood and bathing in it. He also mentions the famed berserker fury of Vikings who were known like skinwalkers to wear the skins of wolves or bears when they went out to drink the blood of their victims. So again, we have homicidal insanity, the consumption of human bodily fluids, ritualistic clothing, or lack thereof. Speaking of lack of clothing, since the savage werewolf murder of Bradford Jackson occurred in Alexandria, Virginia, I went back into the archives looking specifically for early American mention of werewolves in Virginia. And in that case, the earliest example of a werewolf that I could find was a British legend of a werewolf retold in the pages of the Richmond Times-Dispatch on July 2nd, 1888. And I won't tell you that whole story, but the key element that caught my attention there was that in this werewolf legend, when a man transformed into a werewolf, that transformation would go on for days at a time and not just on a single full moon night. But more notable was the fact that he would remove his clothing first, and then become the wolf. And if his clothing were taken, as his unfaithful wife did in this legend, the man would then remain a werewolf until his clothing was returned to him. And so from all these legends, there emerge, as I briefly mentioned earlier, some persistent themes. Homicidal insanity, either induced by or resulting in cannibalism, child murder, the application or removal of clothing, or salves, or some other unholy substance. Stubbs had a belt. Many of the European werewolves had a satanic salve. Countess Elizabeth and Marshal de Retz consumed and bathed in the blood of children. Viking berserkers and Navajo skinwalkers wore the pelts of predators. The British werewolf would remain a werewolf so long as he was naked. Nearly all the werewolves either consumed human flesh or drank human bodily fluids. So again... What makes a werewolf? Some combination of special garments, or no garments, nakedness, homicidal rage, homicidal insanity, consumption of human flesh or bodily fluids. Across the millennia and across cultures, these elements were consistent. And so keep those parameters in mind, because if you're ready, it is time 
to put your personal items underneath the seat in front of you. Stow your carry-on in the overhead compartment. Let go of the worries of the day, but be sure your seat belt is fastened. There's turbulence expected ahead. Real-life lycanthropes, the savage werewolf murder of Bradford Jackson starts now. In 2018, 65-year-old Brad Jackson worked as a salesman at Window Universe on the busy King Street in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. He could be seen daily riding his bike through town, and friends described him as very warm and non-confrontational. The nicest guy you've ever met in your life. He was known to open his home to people in need. His friend Christian Myers said, Brad was like a second father to a lot of people. He was there for me when I had nothing, no place to go at times. Brad was there. In fact, two and a half decades earlier, it was fatherhood that brought Brad Jackson to Virginia, to Alexandria, to raise his son. Jackson grew up in Pontiac, Michigan, the oldest of six boys. He was his high school class president. His younger brother, Chris Jackson, was a protester against the war in Vietnam. Their father was the mayor of Pontiac during court-ordered school desegregation, and the Ku Klux Klan staged violent attacks in the city to try to prevent it. The Jackson home was firebombed and shot at. We basically had a race riot going on and we were all sitting on top of it, Brad's younger brother Chris Jackson recalled. When a bullet pierced the wall of Bradford Jackson's room, he told only his father so as not to alarm the rest of the family. He then hung a picture to cover the hole. Later, Jackson moved with his then wife to the East Coast to focus on raising his son, setting aside career ambitions and political activism. He was a hopeless romantic said his brother Chris. On July 13th, 2018, Brad Jackson rode his bike to work. Previously, Jackson had worked on a Potomac River excursion boat called the Dandy, but now he was the manager at Window Universe, a window and sighting store located on the second floor at 1211 King Street in Alexandria. Friends knew Jackson as someone who was always happy, always smiling with an infectious laugh. That morning, Brad thought about his son Tyler, 24, a Marine. He was so proud of him and so thankful he'd moved to Virginia all those years ago so that he could be close to his son and raise him. And he loved it here anyway. It was a beautiful summer day in Alexandria, and all was right with the world. Of course, there was no way Brad Jackson could have known that just three days earlier, Death had checked himself out of a New Jersey mental hospital and was currently driving the short three and a half hours to Alexandria in the midst of a horrific psychotic break. A UPS driver testified that he went to drop off a package on July 13, 2018, and saw a man matching Death's description, kneeling on the floor, praying. Then the driver said Death ran out the second floor business and jumped into a Mercedes parked on King Street. On that day, Death wore the face of 34-year-old New Jersey man Pankaj Basin. In fact, Basin's family would later reveal that less than a month earlier, in the midst of a separate psychotic break, Basim had believed himself to be none other than Yama, the Hindu god of death. As for the package the UPS driver was delivering, its recipient had this to say, My landlord called me and said something happened on the second floor, said Yuk Shimomura, a Ginza-trained sushi chef and owner of Nisime, a high-end Japanese restaurant located directly below Window Universe. What I was informed, said Shimomura, was that someone tried to steal my package, and the landlord tried to go there and something happened. I don't know what was delivered, but nothing valuable, continued Shimomura. When asked about what might have been in the package, he said, Some detergent I used for my restaurant and printer paper? Really, nothing valuable. Five years later, authorities would know for certain that Shimomura's package had nothing to do with what happened next. And although Shimomura was obviously completely blameless, I'm sure it was nevertheless a relief to him that his package was not related to the crime in any way, because decent people often feel guilty even when they are innocent. Now, if you'll recall, the UPS driver said that Basin, that's Pankaj Basin, ran out of Window Universe and jumped into a Mercedes. Well, that Mercedes belonged to a mother and a daughter who were sitting in the car when Basin entered it, and they screamed at him to get out over and over before finally exiting the car themselves and using the key fob to lock it repeatedly until police arrived. Bradford Jackson was found dead. 
lying on the floor inside Window Universe. There was blood everywhere I looked, one police detective said. Jackson was found with cuts in his head, his neck, and his torso. A box cutter was found nearby. A dry erase marker was also believed to have been used in the attack. The marker's cap was found embedded. My God, how hard do you have to strike or shove to embed a dry erase marker cap into a body? But the marker's cap was found embedded in the victim's body, police said. The rest of the marker was found in the Mercedes, along with Jackson's killer, Pankaj Basin, who was naked and covered in blood. Basin had stabbed Bradford Jackson 53 times with the box cutter. 53 times. And, and if that wasn't enough, he had also broken Jackson's neck. Cause of death was both blunt force and sharp force trauma. Basin, who had once been a successful risk analyst, some irony there, before his severe mental illness began to manifest, had, in June of that same year, not even a month before, been hospitalized after attacking his own family, drinking gasoline and human urine, and claiming to be Yama, the Hindu god of death. A few short weeks later, he would check himself out of the mental hospital, drive to Alexandria, and murder Jackson, who was a total and complete stranger to Basin. At trial, Basin's own attorney said, there was no connection, there was no rhyme, there was no reason, it was totally random. Immediately following Jackson's gratuitously violent murder, Basin would tell police that Jackson had started to change into a werewolf in front of him and that he had to kill Bradford Jackson to save 99% of the moon and the planets. At his first trial, Basin pled not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial ended in a hung jury with most of the jury ready to acquit. Knowledge of this prompted prosecutors and the judge to accept Basin's second insanity plea in 2019. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and criminal insanity, avoiding jail time to instead be sent to the Northern Virginia Mental Health Institute. Now you may have picked up on the fact that I sound angry, and I am. This case makes my blood boil. I tell an awful lot of awful stories, and I usually manage to avoid taking on too much dark emotion because of those stories, although it can be a little tough. And so, you might be a little surprised that I'm angry. I mean, you all know me, and part of my goal with Kind of Murdery and the Kind of Murdery community is to be mental health positive and do what little I can to normalize having mental health conversations. So, I might not be the first person you'd expect to get bent out of shape over an insanity plea. Well, here's why I'm bent out of shape. After spending less than three years in the mental hospital, Pankaj Basin was released in May of 2022. And then, in September of 2022, Alexandria, Virginia community members and friends of Bradford Jackson discovered Pankaj Basin's online dating profiles where he described himself as an easygoing adventurer who believes in universal connection with all and loves to explore and try new things. And also, said his profile, he was getting back from two years of traveling. By two years of traveling, of course he means two years of being committed to a mental hospital as criminally insane after committing an absolutely horrifically violent murder. Jackson's friends found Bossine's profile on Bumble, for Pete's sakes. His recently uncovered dating profile unnerved Sarah Bryan, 37, a friend of Jackson's, who flagged the social media presence to authorities. It's deceptive, Brian told NBC News. I mean, when you meet someone online, you never know who you're going to be going out on a date with for the most part. And I guess it could be a guy who stabbed someone 53 times. A guy who stabbed a complete stranger 53 times. Brian said she was at a loss for words when she spotted Basin's very normal profiles. After the understandably concerned friends of Jackson, single women who had encountered Basin's profile on Bumble and other places brought Basin's online presence to the attention of the judge overseeing his conditional release, Basin was ordered to delete all his social media profiles, with the exception of LinkedIn, which he was allowed to keep to help him find a job. Okay, I have so many problems with this story, and I have to say I surprised myself because I never find myself advocating for harsher treatment, if harsh is even the right word here, which I don't think it is, of the mentally ill. I never find myself advocating for stiffer sentencing, but I am so disgusted by this story. First off, prior to the murder of Jackson, less than a month after attacking his own family, 
claiming to be the god of death and drinking urine and gasoline, how was Basin able to check himself out of a mental institution? Next, as many of Jackson's friends have pointed out, if you can do something this horrific once, this level of horrible overkill, of beyond brutal murder of a complete stranger, if you can do that once, you can absolutely do it again. Sure, the court has ordered him to submit to drug testing, take his meds, and live near his parents who have to check in on him. But since we now know that off his meds, he turns into a brutal, stranger-murdering maniac, how in the world are we erring on the side of this monster's personal freedom? And yes, I said monster because that is what he is. It is unfair to the mentally ill to just call Prakash Basin mentally ill and move on. 99.99999% of mentally ill people don't vacillate between being on meds and being fine and attacking their families and drinking piss and gasoline than thinking they're the god of death and brutally murdering a damn stranger to whom they have no connection. And not only that, and here's where I get even more furious, not even three years, less than three years behind bars, less than four years since his crime, and he's ready to start dating again, I can hardly articulate the lack of remorse, the disgusting self-obsession and self-regard that that reveals. If he was a halfway decent person, if he had a shred of actual guilt or decency about the complete horror that he'd made out of other people's lives, he would be terrified to date again, terrified that he might snap and horrifically murder someone else. And even worse, he might horrifically murder someone he cared about, not even just a complete stranger, someone he cared about because caring about people, isn't that the point of dating after all? The possibility that he might just horrifically murder some poor young woman who's looking for love and romance is less of a problem for him than not dating until he's spent some time proving that he was stable. I mean, look, I believe in redemption, but... Prakash Basin was let out of a hospital for the criminally insane after less than three years. Now, if he went on to live a completely stable life for, I don't know how long is the right amount of time, five years isn't long enough, ten years, twenty years maybe, if he'd gone an entire decade or two without a single psychotic incident. Because keep in mind, he had two horrific psychotic incidents within less than a month in 2018. But... Let's imagine he's gone a couple of decades without a single psychotic break and he decides to make a dating profile and he's ultimately honest about his past with his dates, not lying about it immediately, not suggesting to prospective dates, strangers, remember, he brutally murdered a stranger for no reason, not suggesting to hopeful strangers that his time spent hospitalized after a brutal murder was actually time spent as a, I don't know, wealthy playboy jet-setting around the world. After all, who travels for two straight years except the idly rich? But, like I said, if he's stable for a decade or two and then a dating profile appears after he's proven the ability to be responsible, maybe, maybe that's okay. But he was released in May of 2022, and his dating profiles were discovered in September. So if, if he had even been stable at all, he had been stable for three months, stable on his own, for three months, At most, this just makes me furious. The absolute lack of any guilt or concern for anyone else's safety that this betrays is sickening. He's three months out of Arkham Asylum for the criminally insane after committing one of the most horrific murders I as a true crime podcaster have ever come across. And the bigger problem for him is not whether or not he might snap again and murder a poor innocent woman. The bigger problem is what? He's not dating? And how did this man who stripped naked, drank piss, and stabbed a complete stranger 53 times describe himself in his dating profile? Oh, an easygoing adventurer who believes in a universal connection with all and loves to explore and try new things. What, like gasoline and urine and horrific murder? Like traveling for two years? Oh no, wait, being essentially incarcerated in a mental hospital for being a completely broken monster? And again, I do not believe in attacking people for mental illness. I truly don't. But when you do something as horrible as he did, you have to show some amount of contrition, of self-awareness, of guilt, of desire to be better. And he quite obviously feels and is interested in showing none of those things. He went straight to lying, straight to selfish. As I said, having done what he did, 
any reasonably contrite person, any halfway decent person would be absolutely terrified, terrified that they might have another psychotic break and murder another poor innocent person. And what? Not Prakash. Oh no. Prakash Basin, what's he care about? Getting his damn dick wet. They should throw him in jail right now because he clearly doesn't have enough of a moral compass to worry at all that he might kill someone else. And whoever let him out should be fired or at least not reelected. This is so infuriating. I mean, clearly, the very real possibility that he might kill again and that he might murder some innocent and hopeful woman just trying to find love, the possibility, even probability, that he could commit the murder, Prakash sees as less of a problem than him not dating again immediately. Which brings me to the other set of questions I asked you earlier. What is the purpose of the justice system and incarceration? Is it a deterrent, a punishment, protection, or rehabilitation? Personally, I believe it's all four. But of the four, I believe that protection is the most important, the most achievable, and the most morally unambiguous. Society has a right to protect itself from dangerous people. Does it have a right to deter? Sure. But whether deterrence really works is an open question. Does it have a right to punish? In some but not all cases, yes, but the consequences of that punishment, if meted out incorrectly, for example, if an innocent person is put to death, are morally dire. Does society have a responsibility to rehabilitate? Again, perhaps yes, and where possible, but it will often be impossible or even unwanted and therefore cannot be the top priority. But does society have a right to protect? Absolutely. That's the best reason for the justice system to exist, to protect the innocent from clear and present danger, and protect the one function about which it is not necessary to equivocate. That is the function where the state of Virginia has failed utterly in the case of Prakash Basin. Finally, Basin thought he was killing a werewolf, but between Basin and Bradford Jackson, which one of them was naked, drinking urine, displaying berserker bloodlust and homicidal insanity, that's right, Prakash Basin wasn't killing a werewolf. Prakash Basin is the werewolf. Bradford Jackson was murdered by a werewolf. If anyone hearing this wants justice for Bradford Jackson, reach out to me, kindofmurdery at gmail.com or 888-MURDERY, the Kind of Murdery hotline. This is gross. I want justice for Bradford Jackson. Reach out to me. I'll help. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kind of Murdery. I'll see you Sunday, and if you've got a crazy story to tell me, remember, call the Kind of Murdery hotline. That's 888-MURDERY. 888-MURDER, the letter Y.